heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, we bring you the latest in markets as NVIDIA struggles. We're going to talk macro and micro in Nancy Curtin from Alti Tiedemann Global. Plus, we have the latest from Washington as the Supreme Court sends social media laws back to lower courts. And Qualcomm has become the new front of shirt sponsor for Manchester United. Are chips the new crypto? We discussed that and so much more throughout the hour, but first we check in on these markets and we're struggling for direction, I think can be what's really the read across. We start the new half of the year and we're up about a tenth of a percent on the Nasdaq more broadly, but it seems to be the bond market that's dictating some of that caution in the equity market. Yields push higher, some eight basis points. Read that what you will. Is that caution as to what's happening over in Europe? Is it worries about what's happening in the United States in terms of ultimately fiscal spending coming with whoever runs the country post-November? And I think also what's happening, though, is the political risk actually a bit of a relief over in France. The CAC 40 rising more than a percentage point as we do see perhaps a push to curtail what might be the most right-winger policies that could be enacted over in France as many rush to see what happens in the second round of voting. We look at the economic effect, not the political. Let's have a look at what's happening in terms of crypto, though, because the risk asset of choice here on The Technology Show, we're up 1.4%, 62,755. A bit of a risk-on attitude when it comes to Bitcoin, Ed, but way off our highs of previous. What are you watching on the micro? Uh, there's a lot going on throughout the hour. Let's start with NVIDIA, a headline hit just before we came on air from Reuters, citing anonymous sources that French antitrust regulators are getting ready to charge NVIDIA over anti-competitive practices. You'll remember in September, those dawn raids in NVIDIA's French offices or facilities. We'll continue to track it. I point out the stock is off session lows, and broadly speaking, chip stocks are lower anyway. There's been some selling across the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index, but we'll continue to monitor that, monitor that one. Tesla's going to give us second quarter delivery numbers at some point in the next 24 to 48 hours. We'll go to Craig Trudell and preview those. And then there's the Qualcomm Manchester United front of shirt sponsorship tie up. It says Snapdragon and we'll show it to you later on. By the way, it's July 1st. So happy third quarter mm -hmm. to you, Caroline. Happy second half of the year. We got a data guy at Bloomberg Technology, Terrell Holt, and he's put together this fantastic chart. This is the S&P 500. And at the start of the year, the first half of 24, the S&P 500 is up about 14 percent, right? So he went back and crunched the numbers where the S&P 500 has risen by double digits in the first half of the year. More often than not, it's gone on to have some pretty big gains in the second half of the year. So that's kind of the question, right? What happens next as we enter this second half of 2024? This chart based on history would indicate we continue to climb higher. Do we? Who knows? Well, there's someone who might well know, or at least can align our bets a little bit clearer. Nancy Curtin, global CAO for Alti Tiedemann Global, which manages $70 billion in assets. And Nancy, you're such a voice for us when it comes to artificial intelligence, whether it's hype or reality. And I'm interested as to whether you think the second half will bode well if you're long some of these names like NVIDIA and the chip stocks. Well, look, trees don't grow to the sky, so we need to recognize that these stocks have run a lot uh, already. Uh, having said that, you know, NVIDIA's got a lot of its leave in terms of new product development, right? We've got uh, Blackwell coming on in 2025. Uh, we've got uh, Ruben uh, thereafter. Uh, and so there's quite a lot of product development. Uh, NVIDIA does enjoy a competitive moat in both software uh, and hardware. And, and I think we're just beginning uh, of the purchase of these, uh, these GPU chips from governments uh, and other sectors like healthcare, uh, the automotive sector. Uh, so look, uh, at the end of the day, when a stock has risen 150 uh, percent, there can always be a pullback. Uh, but I would say we're still pretty early uh, innings here uh, on the NVIDIA story. Nancy, we've done a lot on the show of late about how difficult it is, particularly for the sell side, to forecast top line growth. You talked about Blackwell coming online. But you're in the camp of people that says Gen AI is going to change everything, but it's not yet priced in. Uh, which sectors is it not yet priced in for? Where is that not yet being reflected? 
Well, I think given what we've seen uh, in the first quarter and the second quarter, uh, in particular the United States, the second quarter all led uh, by the magnificent five, so to speak. You know, Apple and Tesla obviously lagged a bit, uh, but it was tech, tech, and tech. And so I would say that Gen AI has been priced in to a certain extent to those stocks. They certainly are recognized uh, as Gen AI beneficiaries. But I think the interesting thing uh, is, um, you know, Gen AI is value added across every sector of the economy, or at least that's what we think. Uh, and therefore, looking ahead, uh, we think Gen AI and its implications for innovation, cost savings, productivity improvements in other parts of the economy uh, is not yet priced in. And in any event, our view uh, is that earnings growth will broaden and deepen as the year progresses. It's still about tech in the second quarter, by the way, but as the year progresses, uh, and we think that will lead to a broadening uh, in market participation. So actually, many of our managers, remember, we're open architecture at Alti Tiedemann, uh, have been reducing uh, technology to the benefit to other sectors of the economy that will over time benefit from Gen AI. But also, uh, we think we'll see an acceleration in earnings growth as the year progresses and, frankly, uh, trade on a more attractive valuation. Really important when it comes to publicly traded equities, Nancy. But what's so great about you is we can go cross-asset as well and to private assets and to non-public companies. It's interesting, we on recently had Yummer Crossing Capital Advisors head on recently who've done a partnership with Alti Tiedemann to look at, well, private companies from an equity perspective, but you're looking at it from a debt perspective as well. Where should one be allocating into technology or more broadly? So um, in technology and more broadly, let's just take private credit by way of example. Uh, we think private credit is super interesting because there's a retrenchment happening on the part of the banks. Now, you all saw the stress test last week. Banks need more capital. Uh, Basel III will be punitive uh, in terms of ongoing capital requirements. There's mark-to-market pressures uh, on bank balance sheets. Uh, and of course, small to medium-sized banks, uh, commercial banks uh, that have uh, very high exposure to the commercial real estate uh, sector have been withdrawing from lending, not to mention funding costs going up. Okay, so what's happening here? Banks are retrenching from lending, uh, but marquee credit names uh, are coming in and filling uh, the void. Uh, we initially invested uh, in what are called private lending, direct lending strategies. More recently, uh, we're evolving and moving into what I call asset-backed lending strategies. Again, these are kind of almost investment grade or in another name investment grade, senior secured, high up in the capital structure, uh, and direct lending is about a 2% premium uh, to high yield, uh, whereas asset-backed lending is about a 4% uh, premium to high yield. And, and by the way, these are being okay. offered uh, to wealth channels in sort of semi-liquid form. So it's not hugely illiquid, and that's important as well. Nancy, how is a presidential election in the United States going to impact the technology sector? Wow. Well, the presidential election in the United States got rather entertaining uh, last Thursday in a sort of cringe uh, way, dare I say. Uh, you know, we've got a long way to go here. Uh, before we know uh, whether either candidate or uh, obviously if there's a replacement for Biden remains to be seen. Uh, but look, I think tech companies remain strong. Neither candidate is anti-tech. They both recognize this is a significant competitive advantage uh, to the United States. I don't see IRA or the CHIPS Act being rolled back under either candidate, clearly uh, not if President Biden uh, wins. And these are all important uh, supports for the tech sector. Um, that, in addition to the fact that these technology companies, uh, you know, are spending huge amounts uh, on Gen AI, $200 billion, the four largest tech companies, of course, their CapEx is uh, NVIDIA's revenue. Uh, and so we, we think that continues irrespective of who wins the election. Now, this is a sector that's not really impacted by the election. This is a real secular trend here. Nancy Curtin of LTT Man Global. Just incredible breadth of conversation. Thank you. Let's turn back to some of the breaking news that happened out of Washington in the last hour. The Supreme Court out with multiple decisions this morning. But let's start with the ruling on immunity for former President Trump. Joining us from D.C., Bloomberg's Kaylee Lines. Wow, you had to process a lot of information in a very short period of time. The immunity decision, please. 
Well, the immunity decision is a partial win for Donald Trump and a partial loss. Essentially, what the Supreme Court has ruled is that Donald Trump is immune from prosecution for official acts that he took while in office, not, though, for unofficial acts. In this court, in a 6-3 to three ruling, the conservatives ruling in the majority, the liberal justices dissenting, has essentially set this now down to lower court, specifically Judge Tanya Chutkin, who is overseeing this case brought against him here in Washington related to 2020 election subversion. It will be up to that lower court to decide what is an official and unofficial act within these four counts that Donald Trump has been indicted with. Effectively, what this accomplishes is not only setting a precedent for all future presidents of the United States, as this is a not just about Donald Trump, but about pres presidential authority broadly. It also, though, effectively makes sure that this case will not go to trial for Donald Trump before the election in November. Judge Chutkin has said that the parties will have at least three months to prepare for a trial. And of course, all of this official versus unofficial uh, matter will have to be sorted out as well. So effectively, this does provide a win to Donald Trump in delaying uh, that trial to the point where it likely will not happen before voters make their choice between Donald Trump and Joe Biden in November. Donald Trump, of course, has spoken on this today. He calls it a big win for our Constitution and democracy and said on True Social, he is proud to be an American. Kaylee, you're busy. The lower courts are busy. The lower courts are going to be busy thinking about social media as well. New laws that yeah. wanted to be put in place in Texas and Florida go back there too. Yeah, this is an interesting and complicated opinion that the court also handed down today related to these laws that both Texas and Florida as states have put into place, restricting social media, social media companies uh, ability to restrict content on their platform. Essentially, what the court has ruled for is that those courts need to have their cases thrown out and relook at the First Amendment question here, which, of course, is, is really at the crux uh, of this case. What does and does not violate the First Amendment rights given by the U.S. Constitution? So they're effectively kicking the can back down, not making a decisive ruling, just as they did similarly in a separate social media case ruling earlier this term, in which they essentially handed a win to the Biden administration, not restricting its ability to communicate with social media platform, platforms about content that should be taken down. But in that decision, while it was a win for the administration, they just said that the defendants who brought the case lacked the legal standing to do so. So both in this case today and that other social media related case, they aren't actually ruling on the merits on that key First Amendment question and what crosses the line as you're trying to combat misinformation, but also don't want to restrict the right to free speech. The court hasn't ruled on those things. It's just telling other courts they need to do so again. Kaylee Lines, you always break it down so eloquently. Thank you. A lot to digest there. We appreciate it. Meanwhile, coming up, we're going to be turning our attention to the sharing of your cars. Andre Haddad's been at it for a while, CEO of Turo. He's got an outlook on the travel industry and his company's latest product updates. Ed, what have you got? Some quick breaking news. CDK, which is the software platform that supports car or auto dealers, has issued a statement saying it sees its systems being restored by early July 4th. This is the platform that is front and back office for car dealers that was subject to a hack. Really important. July 4th is a key uh, sales period in the United States for cars, alongside with Memorial Day, Labor Day. So that's the update. The systems will be restored by early July 4th, and that's what we're watching. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg Technology. Let's talk about technology, travel and the transportation industry and how Turo is trying to disrupt it. The company recently shared over 70, 70 product updates aiming to make the rental car experience smoother for consumers. Here with more Turo CEO, Andre Haddad. So normally you would say, I'm going to go to a certain place and I know the date I'm going and then I'm going to try and book a rental car. You've decided one of the things you want to change is that process. You want to pick the car and then work out the location and date later. Just explain how that's going to work in practice. Um, first of all, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, we're, we're very excited about what we're calling our limitless search uh, capabilities. Uh, just to give you a bit of context, you know, the business has grown quite a bit over the last few years, and now we have over 370,000 active listings across 1,600 makes and models. And many of our customers have been asking us, well, it's great that we can search by destination and date as if I am already keen on going on a trip and I know what my dates are, I know my, my destination. 
but I'd like you to show me all the great cars that you've got. So it's more experiential. It's more this idea you want to take a luxury car exactly. or try an EV for the first time, exactly. something like that. Exactly. So, uh, you know, now we've reached a critical mass in all of our markets that we thought this is the moment in time where we can launch this capability. So now if you're looking to, you know, experience that Cybertruck <laughs> uh, or if you want to, uh, uh, you know, maybe test drive a Rivian before you buy it, you can actually find all of these Cybertrucks and Rivians across the country, and then you can decide where to go in order to do that. It's interesting that you bring up Cybertruck, and it's interesting that at this moment, you're also putting out a note trying to describe what the future of transport looks like. And you've really articulated how Turo has been through the highs and the lows of the macro headwinds of COVID, of then everyone wanting to get back into revenge spending. We're also now looking at, ultimately, robo-taxis. How will Turo still survive that pivot in the future? You're right, Carolyn. It's been uh, quite the roller coaster the last few years for travel and transportation. You know, COVID hit in 2020. Uh, then, of course, there was the collapse of big rental in 2020, 2021, the re return of travel, the revenge travel. But also uh, the automotive industry has been changing quite a bit over the last few years. Yeah. And as you know, there's been tremendous inflation and the costs of car ownership and car insurance recently. So within that uh, roller coaster of a ride over the last three years, we're, we're very pleased with our performance as a company. We've increased our revenue by over 400 percent from 150 million in 2020 to 880 million in 2023. We've increased our, uh, the reach of our community of hosts and guests. So we're very pleased with our performance. But it's not the end of the disruption. Uh, you know, the disruption continues in the space. Mm -hmm. And we're very excited to be part of this new class of companies that are helping you know, evolve uh, the transportation and travel industries. We think actually uh, autonomy is a great thing for the industry. Uh, we see the future where we have a lot of these, you know, ride hailing short trips being uh, delivered by autonomous services. You know, our business is much more related to lo much longer trips. Uh, our users tend to book a car for uh, four and a half days on average, and they drive almost 200 miles a day. So. This is a segment that is, I think, independent of the evolution of robo-taxis. You, if you look at third-party data, are the bigger player of two, maybe three, get around. There are some others out there. You've just talked about how much your business has ramped up. So as is tradition on Bloomberg Technology, when a founder CEO comes in, how's going public going and when's it going to happen? Uh, I thought we were going to talk more about the 70 product releases today. We talked about one of the 70 <laughs> in quite a lot of detail, but yeah, it, it all points to the idea you've got momentum and there's a momentum. lot of interest in you guys for that reason as well. Yes, you know, we're, we're ready to go public. Uh, you know, our S1 is ready. We've updated it a few times already, as you know, over the last few years. Uh, but as you know, the financial markets have not been very keen on IPOs over the last couple of years. So as, as soon as that changes, I think we're going to be ready. Uh, Andre Haddad, Turo CEO. As you know, I've been a user of Turo, not just in the United States, elsewhere as well. And it's that experience bit that maybe we'll try out next. Thank you for coming on the program. Now, coming up, we're going to bring you the latest updates from the Atos saga as creditors are set to take control of the embattled French company. Caroline, you're looking at another name. Yeah, I'm looking at a French billionaire eyeing a Latin American-focused telco company, Millicom. I mean, it's basically flat on the day, but it's interesting that billionaire Xavier Niel has offered to buy out the other shareholders of Millicom International in a deal valuing the LATAM carrier at about $4.1 billion. $24 a share, we're currently at 24 and a half. This is Bloomberg Technology. It's time for Talking Tech. And first up, Bridgewater turns to machine learning. The hedge fund giant is set to debut a new fund that will use AI as the primary basis of its decision making. According to sources, the fund will debut with $2 billion of capital starting today and will utilize models developed by OpenAI, Anthropic and Perplexity, among others. Plus, Japan's H3 rocket takes flight again. The Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency saw a successful launch which carried a satellite toward low Earth orbit. It's the second launch for the H3 this year with no crew on board. The flight comes after numerous blunders and delays for the agency, including an explosion of its smaller Epsilon rocket in 2022. And Amazon 
Coles from an AI startup. The online retailer has hired top executives and employees from Adept AI Labs in a move that bolsters the development of an advanced version of AI that can think like a human. According to a memo provided to Bloomberg, Amazon will use Adept's tech to develop products that help automate software workflows. Carolyn. And these aqua hires are interesting. Meanwhile, look, let's go to France because following months long battle over the future of the French IT firm Atos, it is once hailed as the rising star of the country's tech industry and will now creditors are set to take control of the company. Joining us, Bloomberg's Irene Garcia Perez. And you really look at the company from a distressed debt perspective. That's correct. Boy, was it distressed. And now creditors are the ones that are going to be the savior. That's, that's right. It's been a months-long negotiation. The company started to discuss the situation with creditors in February. Mm. Um, and we're nearing, yeah, it's July already, and we finally have um, an agreement in principle, and now it's about uh, other creditors um, joining this deal. You know, Rene, later in the show, we're going to talk about UEFA Euro 2024, of which Atos is the official IT partner and one of its main sponsors. We were reflecting off air that, like, this has been a wild battle. It's been a really difficult and ongoing situation. Even our producer, John Hyland, was like, when does this end? You know, we've been covering this for a while. Is there a kind of line of sight to what happens next? Well, um, the restructuring should be wrapped up by the end of the year. What happens next once the company has enough creditors agreeing to this, signing the lockup, they start a court process called the ASCA court in, in France to start um, an accelerated safeguard, which allows the company to cram down dissenting creditors, if there were any, and get the deal approved. And that should happen by the end of the year. Looking at the deal, equity, zilch, zero, goes to nothing. 2.9 billion euros of loans and bonds are turned into equity. 1.68 billion euros of new debt, injecting 233 million in new equity, we understand. And perhaps looking at the deal to send part, sell part of Atos to the French government. Yes, exactly. So here the main argument is that creditors like the company a lot and they argue that, well, they will sell it to the French government if it makes sense. Otherwise, they're happy to keep it. They don't have any intention to move the headquarters from, um, from France. It will still be a French company, even if the revenue, actually 90% of it, is out of, outside of France. But they, they plan to you know, stick to it being a French company. And that's one of the things of the Kretinsky offer they didn't like. They didn't want to split the company. So, um, yeah, the plan for them is we will send operations if it makes sense. Otherwise, we're happy to keep it together. How is Irene Garcia Perez walking us through what has been long fought out battle? Still some T's to cross, I's to dot. Coming up, Tesla expected to report another quarter of week sales. More on that next. This is Bloomberg Technology. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. Caroline Hyde in New York. Let's get a quick check on these markets because we're being whipsawed by, well, political angst, whether it's in France, whether it's in the United States. And yields have been pushing higher. But notably, actually, the Nasdaq has found some resilience today in the face of yields pushing up some eight basis points in the 10-year. Nasdaq 100 up about tenth of a percent to start off the beginning of the new second half of the year. And we're up just a tenth of a percent. But remember, we're selling off on Friday. We've got the CAC 40 up 1.3 percent as the closed trade in Europe. We are seeing some signs of, well, relief post the first round of voting that happened in France and trying to understand whether or not we'll see some of the more significant right policies come into act. We're currently up 1.3 percent. The euro also just a little bit stronger versus the US dollar. The dollar picked up steam, though, perhaps on some of the political anxiety here in the United States. Move on and look at some of the individual movers that we're looking at on the day, Ed. I want to shine a light on NVIDIA. I mean, what a topsy-turvy day for the chip maker. We were down some 2%. We were dragging on the big benchmarks. Now we're currently up about three tenths of a percent, even as we get a Reuters report saying that maybe we're getting near an antitrust charge coming from France. We're currently, though, still managing to be resilient on this particular chip name. I'm looking at Chewy now off by 5.9%. Again, a roller coaster ride for this particular name. Online, if you're going to be getting into your food for your pets. But this is all about Keith Gill. This is about Roaring Kitty. This is about Ryan Cohen not only being the leader of GameStop, but he's the co-founder of Chewy. And now it looks as though we've got a big open interest, a big long coming from Keith Gill. But it's not enough to stabilise the stock on the longer term. I'm looking at BYD. I'm looking at the American depository receipts for this Chinese car maker. 
Bloomberg News getting the data that basically we've seen once again some record sales coming from this particular company, hybrid and indeed EVs doing very well. Why? Price cuts were up some eight tenths of percent. But you're looking at EVs a little bit more, Ed. Yeah, well, I'm looking at Tesla. It's up six percent in the session, which kind of came out of nowhere. That's its fifth straight day of gains, which unbelievably is its best winning streak in almost a year. The company is expected to post a drop in quarterly deliveries, its second consecutive quarterly decline. Bloomberg's Craig Trudell, our global cars editor, joins us out of London. And I'm looking at the markets like Tesla's up a lot. And one of the logics appears to be that the domestic EV makers in China, BYD included, are showing really strong data. And so we might be extrapolating out that Tesla does well there. Even overall, we expect this kind of continued deceleration in growth. Also, maybe chalk this up to, you know, if Keith Gill is back in the headlines, maybe, you know, <laughs> the, one, of, one of the ultimate meme stocks is, is uh, you know, benefiting from memeiness and, and, you know, because really when you look at the fundamentals of this business, I mean, just one analyst after another has come out with a report, you know, uh, dialing back their expectations for, for this quarter's deliveries. Uh, we do see, you know, monthly uh, wholesale uh, data out of China uh, that has not been uh, strong for, for Tesla in, in the first couple months of this quarter. So I think, you know, the likelihood of a, of a surprise, uh, you know, last month that sort of rescues the quarter mm -hmm. for the company seems, seems fairly remote. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it really is a head scratcher. I, I think, you know, beyond just the the sort of, you know, presence of, of uh, you know, ebullience among retail investors, maybe just also looking ahead to uh, the, the robo taxi that, yeah. that's coming out uh, uh -huh. and that unveiling in August. It does feel like investors are wanting to go more long term viewpoint on this stock because the medium to short term is looking pretty ugly, Craig. And we're running out of excuses. You've got a great story out from the team really talking about 441,000 EVs being sold for the second quarter. Look, I mean, we can't blame Middle Eastern supply chain disruptions anymore. <laughs> right. I, I mean, the, the company has, you know, pointed to it did point to things in the first quarter that really affected, you know, the more so the production side. And it was, it was sort of reluctant to really speak to demand issues. And that's been you know, sort of Musk's M.O. And, and, you know, to his credit for years, he was proven right that he had, you know, plenty of, of demand to, to work with and that that was not the company's problem. I think, you know, we, we see more and more evidence, you know, by the day that this is a company that does have demand issues, that, you know, does have a, a bit of a tired lineup at this point and has a lot more competition to contend with. It, it is still the case that the Model Y does in, incredible volume. Uh, but it's really tough to build on uh, a year when that was the best selling vehicle in the world. And it, you know, it's only gotten a, another year older. Uh, th this was a vehicle after all that debuted in, in the year 2020. And so, you know, generally around this time, you see, you know, a refresh, which Musk has sort of ruled out. So, you know, what exactly this company does to sort of, you know, touch off that next, uh, you know, era of growth really still kind of remains to be seen because I think the expectation is that the robo taxi is more of an idea and a concept as opposed to something that for the here and now and, and really the fundamentals of the business. We get those fundamentals tomorrow. Craig Trudell, thank you so much. Meanwhile, coming up, we're going to dig into the private side of the market. We're joined by IVP general partner Tom Lavaro to discuss current investing trends. And basically, are we out of the woods? Are we back to all risk on for CEOs right now? We're talking the state of the software economy, Ed. What are you watching? Oh, I've got some drama. I've oh, got yeah. some activist drama. Take a look at Massimo, uh, health tech, wearables. Uh, there's a regulatory filing out where basically the CEO of the company is saying that if an activist, which is Politan Capital Management, takes control and tries to remove CEO Joe Chiani, the COO says, I'll resign. And as the headline of that chart shows, a lot of the staff seem to agree with that position. A drop of 7.6% is its biggest decline in eight weeks. But interesting, we have another activist situation on our hands. And on this program, we like to track those. Stick with us. We'll be right back. Bloomberg Technology. artificial intelligence. K-Health has just raised $50 million in a funding round led by Claro Group. And the startup provides patients with a chatbot to make primary care basically more accessible. 
And the recent funding round has set the company's valuation at about $900 million. K-Health co-founder, CEO, Alain Bloch, joins us now. And Alain, I love the piece that we have from Marcelo Clare, basically saying, I'm so done with the hype around AI. I want to see companies using it, fixing a world problem. He says, you're doing it. How are you doing it? Well, we decided to focus on a big problem called primary care. That's the access to health care. There's about a billion uh, primary care visits a year in America. People have chronic conditions, they have preventative needs, and they have acute care. And we built software that allows you to engage with patients and with your electronic medical records and with doctors, and it allows doctors uh, to focus on making the decisions and engaging with patients. That's really, really tough to do. You need to build a lot of intelligence into the system. But that allows health systems to now to integrate AI and clinical AI in their day-to-day, -day, in their primary care. For example, we're integrated into Cedar sinai So we can manage you uh, remotely with primary care, but we can also integrate you into specialist test labs in a, in a world-class health system. Now, people will recognize you because you're a co-CEO of Wix. You're also co-founder CEO of Room. You've been there, done that, taking companies public. I'm interested as to this particular problem that you're trying to solve. How are you seeing the efficiency gains? How are you measuring your success at this earlier stage, other than being able to raise funds? I think the, that's a great question. I think the main focus always needs to be on quality. It needs to be better quality. And everybody, everybody always complains about healthcare. It's so expensive, it's so tough to be in front of doctors. So the three things we look at, first is quality. B, can we make the doctor's life easier? Do they need to spend much less time collecting information, organizing it? Imagine having this really smart resident there who prepared everything there. Now the doctor can come in, can focus on the judgment, can focus on the patient. So you're saving a lot of times so the productivity improvements are large. And then there's also access. We provide it 24 seven. Uh, just like you'd want to get from your health system. And it needs to be grounded in your electronic medical record. We need to be able to provide you personalized uh, medicine. So you need to bring all those pieces together and they need to go hand in hand. Alan, cr critically, the point with K-Health is that the diagnosis, treatment or onward referral to a specialist is still determined by a human being. But are you able to share any data about the sort of success rates of treatment by using the platform and then having a means for a doctor to say, okay, this is the patient before me, this is the information I have available, this is what we're going to do? Well, we, um, we can see everything anonymously that the doctor does and we can learn from it. Bear in mind, the doctor, if new things could happen, uh, new symptoms can appear down the road, sometimes doctors change their diagnosis. So yes, you're right, the doctors are making the diagnosis and treatment decisions, but we're letting, um, Doctors essentially have a co-pilot that does a lot of the basic work, but also some of the nuanced insights that can help doctors make decisions. And then we have this look back, the ability to look at outcome data and, and, and see the patients regularly. When you work, uh, for example, in Cedar sinai where we're integrated, you are getting an aside uh, primary care just like any, anywhere else. It's just 24 seven and you can manage this directly um, and, and, you, and you can get, again, the prescription, the referral, anything else you'd expect and need but now you have yeah, just much more convenience and all you need is your insurance. Alan Block, K-Health CEO. Uh, it's an interesting case study. We are hearing it more often, this kind of service in the healthcare industry in the United States. Thank you for Thank your you. time. Let's keep a conversation going and discuss trends in the world of venture capital and VC-backed startups, the macro environment's impact on startups and a lot more with returning to the show, IVP general partner, Tom Levero. You know, it seems a strange place to start, but quite a lot's changed since you were last on the program. A lot of it driven by AI. The economy has changed and we are bracing for a presidential election. This country in Europe, something similar is happening. How's things going? It's been a rough couple of years for startups. That's a nice way to start the conversation, Tom. Thank you. <laughs> it's the truth. That's my job. Get out there in front of founders and tell them how it is. Um, it's been a rough couple of years. There's been a lot of startup shutdowns, layoffs. But things are changing. You have been, uh, as you do regularly, penning your thoughts, uh, posting kind of thought pieces to, to social media. We've taken one from LinkedIn, for example, and you, you're arguing it's time for offense. So no matter how bleak things might seem, you, you seem to believe that it's time to fight back if you're a startup or a founder. Founders need to anticipate where things are going. And I firmly believe right now the winds are shifting and the economy is getting better and startup founders can't wait for the economic data from 12 months ago to decide 
to try and beat their competition, grow a little faster, um, hire more people, I think right now is the perfect time. Tom, you like putting your thoughts, as we said, to social media. And previously, you were calling for a mass extinction event. And so we kind of got to rate the, the wisdom with which we should see your current viewpoint with how it turned out in 2023, 2024. How was that mass extinction? Did it bear in the way that you thought it would? Did companies manage to succeed and, and muddle through more than you anticipated? Yeah, I think that piece really resonated with the founders and the startup ecosystem because we were able to express something out loud. A lot of them were thinking privately. And if you objectively look at the data from the past couple of years, startup shutdowns are up between 3 and 10x. Layoffs are a huge multiple of what they were before the zero interest rate environment. By every measure, it's been a startup extinction event out there. But some companies have done well, notably some have actually managed to sell themselves. One of your own portfolio companies, HashiCorp, being bought by IBM. What's interesting is we're hearing more and more in the AI sphere that companies are looking for mergers. They can't always sustain themselves. Are you seeing that among your portfolio companies, that they're either able to buy others or we're seeing more M&A within the, the private markets? Yeah, I think M&A feels like it's beginning to warm up. The big acquirers, the major public companies... Uh, seem to be putting out feelers, starting conversations for the first time in a while. I think that's because startup expectations are more reasonable than they were uh, during that zero interest rate environment. Mm -hmm. uh, but their stock prices, frankly, are back up. So they're feeling a little bit more confident about uh, acquiring smaller startups that are probably not profitable. And then now they have a real reason uh, to go and make acquisitions, which is AI. There's this platform shift they know they need to be part of. And the startups tend to move faster in that realm. Reading your work, I am going to channel my inner Tom Keen. Tom Keen, long time story, Bloomberg anchor. And it's like, it's like Darwin and Wallace, natural selection. You're basically saying between 2020 and 2023, things were very bad. But actually, what happened was good startups survived. The others were all killed. So that's a nice market to have. You only have good things in front of you, basically. Is that fair? Yeah, I, I mean, listen, if you can have money and a good business during a downturn, it's the best time to build. But I think founders sometimes lose track of where we are with the economy, a little bit of like Stockholm syndrome, where you get so used to being in a down economy, you forget to go on offense. And that's what the latest piece is about. It's, hey, founders, the economy really is better. It's OK to start thinking aggressively again. Don't go to the extremes of burning way too much money and being efficient. But let's, let's think about offense again, because startups naturally need to be on offense. If you're not, somebody else is. Tom Navarro, we thank you so much for coming back on IVP General Partner and all things offense. Meanwhile, coming up, we'll talk about how tech companies are trying to become household names, perhaps by going on the offense when it comes to European football. Yep, we're calling it football. We'll have all the details next. Meanwhile, look, I'm watching shares of Meta at the moment, Ed. It's interesting, isn't it? Once again, the EU saying not good enough. Basically, Thierry Breton is saying that the Digital Markets Act, once again, is sort of being pushed against by Meta. They're saying they're forcing millions of users across the EU to a binary choice, to pay or consent. They're giving a warning over the subscription model for ad-free services on Instagram and Facebook. Keeping a keen eye on what the EU is saying to the likes of Meta and Apple. Yeah. This is Bloomberg Technology. Let's talk chips because SK Hynix is the semiconductor arm of the SK Group. It's planned to invest close to $75 billion through 2028 underscoring the conglomerate's bet on a sector that it considers crucial for future-proofing its businesses. Now, the group says about 80% of this sum will be allocated to investing in, you guessed it, your favorite, Ed, high bandwidth memory chips. What are you looking at? Qualcomm has become the new front-of-shirt sponsor for Manchester United Football Club. This, the company's latest attempt to boost awareness of its Snapdragon brand among consumers amid a broader push into personal computing and here to not only discuss this massive commercial deal but also <laughs> illustrate demonstrate it is bloomberg's only and king who leads our semiconductor coverage and just so happens to be a manchester united fan but there it is 
you know, it, it's something that you just didn't think you'd ever see. But for Qualcomm, this is a big, big deal. Right. So th this is not even just the company name. This is their brand. This is them trying to do something that they've really been trying to do for 10 years and not making a lot of progress in. And now they're saying, look, this is how committed we are. This is what, what we're prepared to put money behind. And obviously, this is a very big brand. How much money are we talking, Ian? They, they won't, neither, neither side will tell us, but we have a report saying uh, about $75 million a year, and it's going to probably stretch over five years. Uh, Director Alice, you know, I'll just try and get this. I, I hold up for me. There you go. Yeah. I mean, the point is, is that it's a chip. It's a semiconductor. Historically, that Qualcomm's put into smartphones, there's an AI story with it now. It, there's a cult following around it. Right just explain its next iteration. Yeah, I mean, the, the most important thing here is they want, they've been trying to get their chips into laptops for a long time. Hasn't really happened. Now they're saying new AI software will help them to do that. But what's happening behind the scenes, the kind of giant elephant in the room here, like Manchester United in the 90s, a very successful team, is Intel. Intel have dominated this market, not only with their products, but with their brand, right? That anybody who's trying to get into laptops has to take on the Intel Inside brand. And this is what Qualcomm is trying to do with this and other efforts. Ah, uh, just that word takes me back to the Beckham documentary and when all the feel-good factors around, whether it's England, whether it's Man U, I mean, I think Eric Cantona's had something to do with the marketing of all of this, Ian. And just how many of these tech names or US tech names are going into sports like this to big up their name. How much do you see chips more broadly get into the world of football or soccer? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, diff I mean, it's an ingredient brand, so it's always been sort of one step back. Intel were the ones that really broke that with the Intel Inside campaign and really pushed the idea that, hey, you don't buy something for the company that makes it, you buy something because of what's inside it. And Qualcomm are trying to make that next step. They, they're the first. We've seen other companies sort of flirt with this, but this is probably the biggest effort we've seen so far to really get a content brand, a content sort of product in front of real consumers who, who ultimately Great. be the ones well, that Well, Qualcomm's saying that one Premier League home game will have the same value to them as, as spending on a Super Bowl ad. That's what we're talking about. Blue Mose, Ian King, uh, incredible reporting. Thank you. Uh, I just got back from vacation, and when I was in Europe a couple of weeks ago, I noticed that in the midst of celebrations around the UEFA European Football Tournament, something else is part of the landscape, Karen. That is Chinese technology companies hmm. being sponsors. EV Maker, BYD, AliExpress, Alipay. And it's in, in this era of increasing tech competition between the US and China, I just was so surprised to see these names so present on the football broadcasts from the BBC, ITV in Europe. I was in mainland Europe, looking at uh, continental Europe. What do you make of that? So what? Previously, it was crypto names all sponsoring shirts. Now it's chips and it's also Chinese e-commerce. But just the amount that they're spending, Ed, here, how much do they need to build on the app downloads to be able to vindicate the sort of marketing spend on a UEFA game? So this is definitely about going after the European market. But the interesting comparison is Timu. Remember, mm. Timu did a lot of ads around the Super Bowl in 2023. They saw a massive surge in yeah. downloads of their app and then activity in that market. So you look at AliExpress as an example, they're clearly hoping for the same. BYD, the doors closed for them here in the United States. But in Europe, 1% of the EV market, there's a lot for them to play for. So who? they've been sponsoring in which games were you shouting at the tv in a in a bar or a pub or a ha at home that's what's so astonishing all the games they are, they're in the live uh broadcasts of all the games irrespective of which german italian french uk broadcasts you watch but when i got back fox sports has the rights to the euros here yeah and you can still see them through that as well so it is everywhere oh, they want to be omniscient omnipotent we do it all here on bluebird technology particularly sports and tech we thank you. That's it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology, though, Ed. We didn't get to talk about yeah, Chelsea. Incredible amount of breaking news as well. So there's a lot to recap. Do so on the podcast. You know exactly where to find it. Apple, Spotify, iHeart and the Bloomberg platforms. From New York and San Francisco, this is Bloomberg Technology.